Hello everyone, Paul here with the first of two lectures on plate tectonics. And so plate tectonics is um, sort of the great unifying theory of geology. Uh, plate tectonics is kind of what gets geology to make sense, right? Without plate tectonics, geology kind of collapses into this pile of things that we under that we know rather but we don't understand and so uh plate tectonics explains things um you know geology is a fairly young science it's going to get, get its beginnings in the 1860s and it's not going to be until the 20th century uh 1915 in particular uh that we begin to get an inkling about you know a systematic theory to explain everything and so Really, you know, geology is going to labor for about a hundred years um, without a great unifying theory. Uh, you know, for astronomy, we went all the way back to the 1400s. We could have gone back to the, you know, to the ancient Babylonians and the ancient, um, you know, Egyptians and whatnot. Uh, with geology, we're really going to, we're going to pick up in 1915 um, with a guy named Alfred Wegener. Um, Alfred Wegener was the first to propose this idea uh, that he called continental drift. Now, when you've learned this before, you might have learned plate tectonics and continental drift as practically the same thing. Okay, they're not. Uh, continental drift is an older idea that, as we're going to see, uh, was mostly right, uh, but wrong about some things, and was replaced by plate tectonics, which is kind of an updated version of continental drift. So in 1915, though, Alfred Wegener uh, proposed this idea of continental drift, just that the continents are moving, right? Now, you know, nowadays that's kind of a given, and, we, you know, none of us really have any issues with that. But in 1915, you're going to say that continents are moving? You better have some pretty good evidence for it. So let's take a look at what the evidence that Wegener had. Uh, for this idea of continental drift because this also provides us with evidence for plate tectonics, right? So first of all the continents kind of fit together right, uh, you know South America and Africa fit nicely Florida by the way goes right down in there uh, And here here's like all the continents, right? So South America Africa North America, India, Madagascar, Antarctica, and Australia, and then Europe and Asia are kind of tacked on up here, right? You know, and it was really not until we got really good maps that we really could tell that, you know, the coastlines of these continents match up um, until you really know what the coastlines look like. That's hard to get to, but, but nevertheless. The other thing is, if you look at rock bodies that are old enough, uh, and they need to be pretty old. They need to, like, predate the dinosaurs, like, older than, you know, a couple hundred million years old. So, so but if rock bodies are old enough, um, they will cross from one continent to another. Our Appalachian Mountains here uh, can also be found up here in, um, sorry, that's uh, Greenland. <laughs> um, but then also in Ireland and Scotland and the Caledonian Mountains in Scandinavia, but also over here in Africa. Uh, exactly the same rock. Exactly the same rock. In fact, if you drill underneath the limestone here in Florida, get down below the limestone, you'll hit rock that matches up to Africa over here. Um, and so, you know, Wagner was like, look, if you bring everything back together, well, now it makes sense, right? This this is our Appalachian Mountains, and you know, in fact, this this mountain range that we call the Central Pangean Mountains, when we look at it like this, formed right when Europe, North America, Africa, and South America all hit each other uh, to make Pangaea, and then when Pangaea broke apart, all of this similar rock ended up on different continents, where we find it today. Right. Fossils will do the same thing, by the way. If your fossils are old enough, and once again, predating the dinosaurs, we'll talk about that. Um, uh, so things that are pretty dang old, like 300-ish million years old and older. Um, uh, maybe maybe a little younger than that. Let's say 250-ish million years old and, and, and older. Uh, fossils will cross from one continent to another. Uh, for example, we can see here, here's a... Lystrosaurus, and we find that here in South America, and then over here in Southern Africa, right? Which is not too bad, but but you know, you know, kind of weird. Um, this Mesosaurus here, a little aquatic reptile, 
uh, here in South America, and then also again over here in Africa, right? Uh, this glyptodon here, right? Here in in Africa. Now this starts getting weird. Madagascar, northern India, and Antarctica. What the heck, y'all? Right? Things don't live in northern India and Antarctica. That's just weird, right? That's like us and bacteria. Uh, so, you know, things don't, yeah, that, those are very, very different environments. But, you know, the thing that takes the cake for this is this uh, giant swamp called the Glossopterus flora. It is a whole bunch of plants dominated by a fern called Glossopterus. So we named the whole thing after that. So it's the Glossopterus flora. We find it South America, Africa, Southern Madagascar, Southern India, Antarctica, and Central Australia, right? That's just strange, right? Those are very, very different environments these days. And nothing is going to live in all those places. You know, it's just, 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 it's just not, right? And so if you take away this for a second and we look at this, we see that, you know, these ranges, as I've drawn them here with the continents where they are today, don't really make any sense, okay? But if I do that, they do, right? If I bring everything back together, uh, then yeah, they make perfect sense right this 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 glossopterous thing here uh that's you know um just just you know it's it's a, it's a giant central swamp <laughs> you know really um <clears throat> right we live in florida we know all about swamps right go go south of the everglades right uh and so yeah so so these ranges really only make sense if you um if you uh put the continents back together right there's also some interesting climate indicators there are certain rocks that are very indicative of certain climates um for example uh coal um coal is a rock we burn it for power don't burn coal do whatever you want with coal just don't burn it um and because it just releases all kinds of bad things into the air um but anyway when you find coal that is a tropical deposit right coal forms in swamps coal swamps look like this uh, coal is what happens when you have more plant material hitting the forest floor than is decomposing. So you have a, a faster input of plant material than you have it being removed. Uh, it accumulates, it gets compressed, it makes peat. Um, and then uh, if you continue to compress it, uh, it makes coal. This happens in the tropics. So let's go back to our map. And the little putting green looking things are coal deposits well look at where these are the, 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 here's the equator right uh, <laughs> that, that, that's you know think about where think about where the american coal beds are right pennsylvania west virginia kentucky iowa montana right those are not tropical places right there that, that's not tropical right the equator is all the way down here that's not tropical so we say okay well you know the climate noodles around a little bit maybe climate maybe it was hotter no 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 it was never hot enough to put tropical forests in pennsylvania okay no okay if that's happening then the equator is on fire and as we're about to talk about uh there was ice on the equator during this time so no that doesn't really make any sense okay um so yeah these coal beds you know where they are today being tropical doesn't really make any sense and you cannot account for it by noodling the earth's climate around a little bit but what about this ice well so the white on here is glacial ice with the arrows showing the directions that it moves right glaciers are these huge sheets of ice um here i am standing in front of one in british columbia uh let me show you the glacier without the without me in it and so uh this huge flowing uh sheet of ice right this is what this is a glacier this is the Athabasca glacier um in the Colombian ice fields up in Canada and you know when you look at the rock um 
it's got these these scrapes running across it called striations here let me show you let me look let's look let's look straight down and we can see see these these grooves carved in the rock those are glacial striations and um, a good uh, glacial person can tell you what direction the glacier was moving by looking at these very carefully right and so not only do we know where the glaciers were because glacial glaciers make very characteristic rock deposits that any geologist worth their salt can pick out no problem and so we know where the glaciers were and we know what direction they were moving uh, even in the rock record even hundreds of millions of years ago we know when and where there were glaciers and we know what direction they were moving and so when we look at these very very old rock deposits we see evidence of glaciers first of all at places they shouldn't be on the equator right but also moving in directions they ought not move right here we have glaciers moving up out of the indian ocean toward the tallest mountain range in the world the himalayas that doesn't make any sense right glaciers flow downhill like everything else does okay um over here same thing right glaciers coming up out of the atlantic ocean toward the second tallest mountain range in the world um, the Andes, and so, yeah, still not making any sense, right, over here, coming up out, and, and no, right, the, the, these directions don't really make any sense, and these glaciers here on the equator, uh, more or less at sea level, also not really making sense, okay, but let's do this, right, if I bring everything back together, now my coal seams are on the equator, and my glaciers are over Antarctica, and you know one big continent, the uh, the Andes Mountains haven't formed yet. India has not hit Asia yet to make the Himalayan Mountains. All of this makes sense, right? And so Wegener realized this. Wegener realized that you know, look, uh, continents are fitting together. Rock bodies go from one continent to another. Fossil ranges cross continents in very strange ways, and you know we see evidence of climates in locations where those climates don't make any sense right glaciers along the equator coal way too far north um etc so Wegener laid all this out in a book um i believe it's called the origin of continents um and it really didn't do well um <laughs> people just didn't believe him um they 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 just didn't um there were some problems um and you know people just really weren't ready for it but there were definitely some problems too right wegner had no idea about a mechanism for moving the continents he really he really didn't know what was moving the continents right so you know that's i mean look <laughs> be honest with you we'll talk about this but even today we're not really sure what's moving those tectonic plates. Now we've got some ideas and we can directly measure the plate motion. So it's not as big a deal as it was back then that we don't know, but we're still not really clear on all this. Um, uh, Wegener also got something wrong. Wegener thought that the continents were moving, but the seafloor wasn't. So now you need to not only move the continent, but now you need to move it, I don't even know, right? Through over around around doesn't seem like it would work uh you know somehow you need to move the continent and not the seafloor right that, that's hard that, that's that's hard to do um the other thing though is there were other explanations for the rock and fossil distributions right people are like look you know organisms migrate from one continent to another all the time by crossing land bridges or with island stepping stones or by clinging on to debris right and all of this stuff happens right i mean south um sorry panama is a land bridge between north and south america and there have been several faunal interchanges across panama between north and south america rafting i mean when you go to hawaii you don't come on you know rocky islands there's there's stuff living there that got there by rafting across the pacific island stepping stones this is also very common in the pacific um you know and so you know or, or, and then there well maybe you know the the appalachian mountains go underwater and come up again in europe or something like that right and but, but you know Continental drift was always in the mix, but people were, frankly, more willing to believe this stuff because they knew this stuff happened. And this was still very, very hypothetical. And so, you know, Wegener put the idea out there, but it really didn't catch on. It just, it really didn't. Um, and then Wegener uh, would, uh, would die, actually, on an expedition to Greenland. He was a very good 
um, um, meteorologist. He was a very good Arctic meteorologist, and he was on an expedition to Greenland, and, um, yeah, he didn't come back. And so without him around to push the idea, it really kind of fell by the wayside. Um, and so, and it's going to fall by the wayside until 1960. Um, and a geologist named Harry Hess, uh, he's going to kind of resurrect um, this idea of continental drift and turn it into plate tectonics um, with something called seafloor spreading. And uh, a lot of this is going to have to do with technological innovation, right? Between 1915 and 1960, a lot happens, right? Um, we're going to, you know, well, First World War, Second World War, um, you know, and war is definitely not good, but it does tend to spur along technology. And the story of Harry Hess um, working out seafloor spreading is very, very tied up in World War II and technology. So let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, this is going to seem like a little bit of a rabbit hole, but just bear with me for a few minutes and I will come back to play tectonics, I promise. Okay, so World War II begins. Harry Hess joins the Navy. Okay, uh, he had been a geology professor at Princeton. Uh, he took a leave of absence, a sabbatical, whatever, joined the Navy. Now, here's the thing we have to understand about World War II. World War II did not begin in 1941. Okay, World War II began in 1939. Okay, when uh, when Germany invaded, you know, Poland and France and basically Europe. Right, the United States for a long time really just didn't want any part of this. Um, until 1941 when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Now we're like, okay, if we got to be in it, we're in it. Okay, now. Um, but here's the thing. By the time we entered the war, um, Europe needed everything. Right? They, they were out of food. They were out of clothing. They were out of everything. They just needed everything. Plus, we had to get our army to Europe or our armed forces, let's say, to Europe uh, to, to fight, right? World War II was not fought in North America. It was fought in Europe and Africa and the Pacific, right? Um, and so we got to get we got to get our stuff over there and we have to supply it and all kinds of things, right? So we started building these inexpensive uh, transport ships called Liberty ships and Harry Hess uh, this was his ship he was captain of this ship um, and so so we just start sending these things across the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean to supply our allies and to supply us and to get all our stuff over there so we could fight the war well the Germans in particular realized that with supply lines spread all the way across the Atlantic Ocean we were vulnerable and indeed we were and to take advantage of that they built submarines inexpensive small uh they called them u-boats uh, and they sent them into the uh atlantic in particular uh to sink our shipping right because the supply lines spread all the way across the atlantic ocean they realized that the easiest way to win this war would be to maybe not have to fight it at all if they could cut our supply lines and they sunk a bunch of ships y'all a bunch of ships they really did um uh, and so let's take a look I promise this will have something to do with plate tectonics. Here's a graph. Orange is our Liberty ship losses. Blue is U-boat losses. 1939, we're not really in the war. Right? 1940, uh, we're not really in the war. 1941, remember Pearl Harbor was December of 1941. So for most of 1941, we're not really in it either. Right? And so we're losing a few ships here and there. They're losing a few ships, but we're not, we're, we're really not in the fight yet. Right now, look at what happens though in 1942. Our, our Liberty ship losses surge, right? Their U-boat losses go up, but not that much, not that much, right? So they're sinking a lot more. I mean, they sink over 500 of our transport ships right we sank less than 100 of theirs right that's not going to work i mean it's going to work for the germans but it's not going to work for us right we, we cannot sustain those losses look at what happens though in 19 um 1943 our losses go way down their losses go way up 1944 we actually sank more submarines than they did ships and by 1945 it's over what happened though between 1942 and 1943 well what happened was sonar Right, the ability to find things underwater by bouncing sound off of them. Okay, sonar. Um, the company that 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 developed sonar went from having about a dozen employees to several thousand pretty much overnight, um, because the Navy said we need one of these on every single one of our ships, 
And so once we equip the ships with sonar, now they can find submarines, they can sink submarines, they can avoid submarines, they know they're down there, right? So, what does this have to do with plate tectonics? Well, Harry Hess says, hey, 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 um, if we point that sonar straight down and run it, as much as it's safe constantly, um, we'll know what the bottom of the seafloor looks like, right? Because here's the thing. They didn't know what the bottom of the seafloor looked like, right? Everyone kind of assumed that you would walk off the beach in, say, Miami, and the water would just get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until you came up in, you know, it, the deepest part would be about in the middle, and then you would come up somewhere in, I don't know, uh, Africa, Morocco, or something like that, and there, right? I mean, they, they just kind of assumed there was really nothing down there because you know near shore there's kind of kind of nothing there right it's just kind of sand and, and everyone just kind of assumed that it was like that and harry hess was like well let's find out right let's let's sound the bottom and so he it wasn't just him he proposed this to the navy and the entire navy was like that's a really good idea let's do that right and so all during world war ii these ships going all over the all over the, the world sounding out the bottom so that we knew what it looked like well, it took a few years after the war for the Navy to declassify the data, but eventually they did. And Marie Tharp and Bruce Heason would draw this map, which is, of course, a very famous map. You've probably seen it before, of the seafloor. Uh, and, you know, everyone was looking at this going, wait, 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 this is not... Uh, this was not what we expected, right? There is, there, there, there most definitely is stuff down there, right? Um, you can see here, you know, there's a mountain range running down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, right? That's not the deepest water there. That's some of the shallowest water. In fact, here in Iceland, it's not even underwater, right? Um, if we look at the Pacific, we see, you know, same thing. There's a mountain range over here. There's all the, you know, the Hawaiian Islands are a whole string of underwater volcanoes. Um, you know, I mean, lots of strings of volcanoes, very deep, excuse me, very deep water there, very deep water up here, very deep water here, water out here, not so deep, etc., etc. And so, you know, everyone was like, wait a second. The other thing, of course, is that, you know, there was clearly never a land bridge connecting South America and Africa, right? The Appalachian Mountains do not go underwater and come up again here or come up again here, right? A lot of the alternatives to uh, to continental just suddenly don't make any sense, right? And so, um, and so, uh, yeah. So everyone's like, wait, we, we need to rethink everything, right? Because this, this is way more complicated than anyone thought it would be. And so the war ends, and Harry Hess goes back to Princeton, and he's thinking about things. And he's like, let, let, let's go measure some heat flow. Let's look, let's look, let me show you on here. So right up here, right, uh, you can see that this mid-ocean ridge here runs right up into Iceland, right? Iceland is seafloor exposed, all right? And so Harry Hess goes, I know Iceland is covered in volcanoes, because you can just look, I mean, Iceland is covered in volcanoes. What's this down here like, right? And so he, so he, he takes a look at the heat flow up along this ridge. He's like, this hot. This rock is hot. These volcanoes up in here extend onto the seafloor. And he gets to thinking. And he says, hey, I have an idea, y'all. He says, let's take a cut across this, right? Across this, this, this mountain range here. Let's look at it from the side. And so let's turn it up and it looks like that, right? So there's the surface of the water. So here's that mountain range. There's a valley in the middle of it that I drew there, right? And so Harry Hess goes, guys, I think what's happening here is we are drawing magma up between these two slabs of rock. And the reason we're drawing that magma up between those two slabs of rock is because it's moving outward on either side. Now, I said that in a very specific way that might be different if you've learned this before uh, from an oceanographer or maybe another science teacher or whatever. But I said that in a very specific way that might be different from what you've heard. You might have heard or at least thought that that magma coming up is wedging that rock apart. It's not. Okay, what's happening is that rock on either side is moving outward and that is sucking that magma up. 
uh, in between, right? Here's a fancy three-dimensional picture of the same thing, right? And so you've got this oceanic crust on either side of that rift moving off to either side, and that draws that magma up. That magma does something called decompression melting. Uh, it melts uh, and makes new seafloor along that rift valley, along that central axis that runs down the Atlantic, up into the Pacific, and even even up into the Indian Ocean, right? And so, um, and so, yeah, so, so Harry has published a paper, in this case called The Origin of Ocean Basins, um, that was the most popular paper ever in geology. Everyone's read it, everyone's read it, um, and, um, and, uh, it basically what it does is it gets around Wegener's problems, right? Because now you don't need to move the continent through the seafloor because now we understand that the seafloor is moving too, right? That the continent, the, in fact, the entire crust of the earth is moving, um, right? The continent is just that visible part. So it gets around Wegener's problem with moving the, the, the continents and not the seafloor. Uh, the other thing is, you know, with the understanding that the mantle of the earth is in motion, that begins to give us an idea about how we might get that crust to move. We're still not clear on it, but we understand that the mantle is moving. That's going to help us get the crust to move. Another thing is, um, you know, if he's right, and he is, but, you know, if this is happening, then if we think about this, this rock running down through here should be younger, right? The rock out here and the rock out here formed when this came up, solidified, and then moved and moved and moved and moved and moved, right? And so now that's out here, and there's younger rock all behind it, right? So this rock here should be old, younger, sorry, I'll get it right. This rock here should be Ah, boy, here we go. This rock should be younger, okay? And the rock should get older as you work your way this way, right? Because this is moving this way. This is moving this way, right? And so you have, you know, younger rock down here and older rock out here, right? If this is this is happening, well, let's take a look. Sure enough, yes. Um, right? Scale from zero... To about 180 or so million years old right and you can see that all the young rock is in the middle and then as um as you move outward it gets older and older and older and older right the youngest rock on the sea floor is you know here, here and here and as we'll see next time this is the rock that formed as pangea broke apart. Pangea unzipped from the north to the south, and so we made some very old rock here. Next lecture, I'll show you some animations showing you how that worked. But we can see a very, very distinct pattern of young rock along these mid-ocean ridges uh, getting older as you work your way out this way, and as you work your way out this way. Same thing over here, it just doesn't get as old this way and that way. Right uh, now, interestingly, uh, I know 180 million years seems old, but it's really not. Right, um, the work, the rock that I work on is about 300 million years old, and and uh, there's rock that's billions of years old, but it's not on the seafloor. Right, the seafloor is kind of constantly being recycled and recycled and recycled. If you want to see really old rock uh, in North America, come up here to a region called the Canadian Shield, up in here. And uh, there's what it looks like. It is just beautiful, y'all. If you ever get a chance, go up to the Canadian Shield. Uh, it's really pretty. But this rock ranges uh, in, in the order of billions of years old. Um, it's in what's called the stable craton of the continent. It's just kind of sat there, been rocked around and smacked up against. But it's still, it's still there. Another place to find really old rock uh, is down here in Australia. Uh, down in here where we find these banded iron formations that are evidence of early early life in our oceans that are you know also on the order of three billion years old or so um, and so but the rock on the seafloor is pretty young but the youngest of it is along those mid-ocean ridges so so 
So, um, so plate tectonics is just the idea that the surface of the Earth is divided up into these pieces called plates, and these are what moves. It's not South America that moves; it's the South American plate that moves, right? Which includes South America, but also you know this part of the uh, of the Atlantic Ocean, right? The Nazca plate doesn't even have a continent on it, right? Nor does the Cocos plate, for that matter. Uh, the the Pacific plate doesn't have a continent on it, right? Um, nevertheless, these are the units of plate tectonics, okay? Now, so this is what's moving, right? But if you look at this, it's not like they have room to move without, you know, smacking up against each other and grinding up against each other, right? And in fact, if I look at the distribution of active volcanoes on the planet, we can see that most, not all, Hawaii is an exception, okay but most of the active volcanoes are at least near a plate boundary right uh here's you know there's the philippine plate with volcanoes around it you know here's that pacific ring of fire that you hear so much uh with all these volcanoes around it you know uh etc etc right so not all like i said there's exceptions hawaii is a big one we'll talk about it we'll talk about volcanoes okay but still Earthquakes, same thing, right? If I look at earthquakes, um, I can see that they are happening, you know, along plate boundaries. Mostly, once again, Hawaii is an exception. North America is kind of an exception that we'll talk about when we talk about um, um, earthquakes. But, but you know, if I gave you this map and said, okay, draw the plate boundaries, okay? Well, okay, right? Yeah, right. There's the, you know, there's the Nazca plate. Here's the Cocos plate. Here's the Pacific. Right? You could do a lot worse than just draw a line through the cloud of red dots, right? This is about three months worth of earthquake, by the way. This is not nearly every earthquake that's ever happened. But there's the Philippine plate. Here's the Indo-Australian plate here outlined by these earthquakes, right? And so, yeah. So it would seem that the fun, geologically speaking, is happening at plate boundaries. Uh, and indeed it is. And so I'm going to stop here in this um, lecture, but next time we will pick up with plate boundaries uh, and what's going on with plate boundaries. And then uh, we'll wrap up uh, talking about mechanisms and how to move a plate. But for now, this is all. Y'all take care and uh, get me if you have any questions. Okay, then thank you all very much.